Roku continues to position itself as a winner in the streaming wars as consumers abandon cable. With 51 million active accounts and 17 billion hours of content streamed in the latest quarter, Roku continues to strengthen its case to advertisers and even posting a surprise profit. But is the growth potential already priced in? Are investors underestimating new entrants like HBO Max, Disney Plus, and, and Paramount? I'm Hope King, and I'm joined by Tom Forte, Senior Research Analyst at DA Davidson. Tom, it's always great to see you. You reiterated a buy rating here, and you also raised your price target to 560 from 300 in reaction to the latest report. So what was your biggest takeaway? So sure, so thanks for having me, Hope. My biggest takeaway is that uh, I can't precisely point to a specific tipping point, but clearly when it comes to over-the-top consumption of video and advertising video on demand, so connected TV ads, however you want to refer to it, it's clearly tipped. And when I think about all the different businesses who are exploiting this opportunity, I really feel like Roku's the best positioned. They have an amazing advertising model and they have an amazing way of both getting users to use their platform and then advertising those users. I think what's I think what's notable is that this is a time when people are maybe streaming more, but they also have more options. And we also know advertising revenue has largely slowed during the pandemic because well, these companies don't know if they're going to get their customers back into stores, uh, back to shopping. So how has Roku been able to actually capitalize on something that has seemed pretty weak here advertising? So it's an excellent question. And if you look at April of 2020, during the heart of the pandemic, digital advertising went negative. Facebook's revenue growth was negative. Google was negative. Pinterest was negative. But Roku, which is leveraging this transition uh, from linear television advertising to over the top, stayed positive. So I'm not saying there wasn't a slowdown in advertising revenue at Roku. There was, but it was still positive. And I think it's because advertise, uh, advertisers realize this is an effective medium for generating a return on spend. Why do you think that is? I mean, specifically, the Roku channel seemed to do sort of better in terms of its reach, doubling its reach in the fourth quarter, usage growing nearly twice as fast as sort of the overall Roku platform. Great question. So we wrote a white paper on Over the Top, and we talked about how we're still in the early innings here. But one of our key findings was we think consumers will have, you know, a limited number of subscription video on demand uh, services. Think Netflix, Disney Plus, things of that nature. And they'll complement their over-the-top viewership with advertising supported models. Think Roku Channel, uh, Crackle, IMDB TV for Amazon. And what you're seeing is cannibalization within the subscription video on demand consumption and still strong usage of ad supported which I think is great news for Roku and its Roku channel in particular. Is that bad news for everybody else that is basically subscription-based with without ads? Well, okay, it's bad news to the extent that you are seeing this cannibalization. But again, I don't know about you, but when I watched the Super Bowl and I saw all those Paramount Plus ads, I was thinking investors should be buying shares of Roku because Roku has really positioned themselves well when Paramount needs subscribers needs reactivations, uh, they go to Roku for advertising, as does Disney Plus, and we think eventually Netflix will do the same. That was not what was going through my mind when I saw those ads, but I can see where you're coming from. All right, what about winning more impressions? You know, research analysts like you, Wall Street uh, analysts, are, are not impressed just uh, by positive numbers. They want to see growth. So where is that growth, do you think, going to, uh, where is that going to come from? Are you impressed by the acquisition of the Quibi content that they have? All, all those are great questions. And I would argue that where the stock's trading today, uh, they need to do well internationally. One of the key comments they made yesterday was that they're the number one operating system, uh, smart TV operating system in Canada. They're making progress in the UK, in Brazil, in Mexico. So as far as future growth comes and what could make Roku an open-ended growth story, it's international expansion. I'm glad you asked me on Quibi. So my thesis on Quibi was if they paid a dollar for it, that's okay. If they paid $1.75 billion or however much Quibi spent to create Quibi, uh, that would be terrible. Uh, but when you think about their ability to monetize content, and I'm making the assumption that this was very affordable 
purchase, uh, much less than 100 million, I think is the number you've seen out there, then I think it's more than okay. And I took their comments in general to suggest that their content, proprietary content strategy will be mindful of the bottom line. So then I think they're not gonna you know, enter the arms race with Netflix and uh, Apple and Amazon and others, which is good news for investors. It's expensive, original content. It's nice because you have exclusivity over some of the shows that might get popular, but it is pretty expensive and, and these bets might not always pay off. Now, Roku, looking forward, had suggested that the second half of this year might be a harder uh, comp, but that they might be doing pretty well for, for this first half. Talk about some other uh, sort of headwinds, especially when you also think about non-connected, non-Roku connected TVs as well. So the challenge historically for Roku in the bear case is that they're swimming with the sharks, meaning they have strategic relationships, but they compete against the most powerful companies uh, really on Wall Street. Uh, they work with and they compete against Amazon and Apple and um, Google's YouTube. So I think that that's always been the challenge. The competitive set is very significant. Now where Roku has been able to differentiate itself is basically positioning itself as the neutral player in the space uh, where they're beneficial to all and um, you know, I think that is important. And I also think that, you know, if the content strategy from Roku focuses more on others' content than its own, uh, they'll be able to maintain that position, which is very good for Roku. So it's still okay to call this sort of the Switzerland of streaming? You use the words I was thinking about using, but the answer is absolutely yes. yes. What about 5G? We've seen lots of ads for 5G. We see 5G rolling out slowly. Is there a price comparison there if 5G really gets going? The way I think about 5G is the good news for Roku and for just anyone in over-the-top streaming is now consumers are getting devices that leverage 5G networks. So the network build-out, especially in the U.S., is still in its infancy. But now that consumers are increasingly getting the handheld devices to take advantage of the networks. Uh, when the network build out comes, I think that's going to be a potential catalyst for video consumption and then for ad revenue for Roku. All right, your time is tight, so I really just want to hit on Shopify pretty quickly. Amazon is seemingly a little bit nervous for you know the, comp uh, the competition coming from Shopify. They just acquired kind of a Shopify competitor. What's going on right now in e-commerce when it comes to Amazon and Shopify? So here's how I think about Shopify versus Amazon. Amazon is of a size now that it needs larger sellers on its platform to grow, to maintain sales growth for Amazon. Therefore, I think there's still a window of opportunity for Shopify to focus on its bread and butter, the small to medium sized enterprise. Uh, those, many of those small to medium sized enterprise customers that are selling on Shopify are too small to move the needle for Amazon. And when you think about Amazon and the transition to Andy Jassy from Jeff Bezos, this is a much larger company. Uh, healthcare, for example, I think is a wonderful opportunity for Amazon. I think Amazon Pharmacy. Small to medium-sized enterprises has a role in third-party selling on Amazon, but they really need the larger sellers to move the needle for Amazon. So I think Shopify is more than okay. And one last question here, Mohawk Group. This is a consumer products company. Its stock has been on a tear. What is Mohawk? There's a relationship with Amazon. So we wrote a white paper on embracing Amazon 2.0 and Mohawk Group is kind of the poster child for that. There's a privately traded unicorn called Thrasio that's another great example. So what Mohawk does is it looks for opportunities to sell products on Amazon. And in some instances, it looks for opportunities where there's a strong uh, seller on Amazon of the product and buys that seller. And then basically with its technology, not only does it find opportunities to make products to sell on Amazon or buy others products, but it also uses this technology to maximize the efficacy of advertising on marketplaces such as Amazon, and then uses its technology to advance the logistics efforts, either fulfillment by Amazon or where Mohawk's doing the fulfillment on in its end. And this is a very hot area. Uh, as we noted in our white paper, there was 660 million of private capital invested in companies that are doing what Mohawk is doing and what Thrasio is doing. And then so far in 2021, Thrasio's had two capital raises, one of 500 million and more recently in February of 750 million. 
So Mohawk Group is starting to get investor attention and it's well-deserved. All right, Tom Forte, that's all the time we have with you today. Thank you so much as always for being with us. Tom Forte is Senior Research Analyst at DA Davidson. Have a good one. You too, my pleasure.